Welcome to the next session on our in our course on using information theory to analyze complex systems. This session is part of our set on information dynamics, the approach for analyzing information processing in complex systems. In this particular session, we're going to look at measuring information storage. So the main outcome for this session is that you understand the measures we'll use for measuring information storage. Principally, the active information storage, as well as later on, the excess entropy and predictive information. I also want you to be able to apply the JRDT toolkit using the auto analyzer and extensions of the code it produces to be able to analyze information storage in complex systems data sets. The primary references for this session, as well as the next session on information transfer, are the JDT paper, as well as my book on local information dynamics and the Bossemeyer book on transfer entropy. So in considering information storage, we're really asking the question about how much information from the past of the variable helps us predict the next state. We're not so much asking about how much information causally remains in the variable. We're asking a question about modeling. Okay, and that's something that will come up again later, the distinction between modeling and the actual underlying causal mechanisms. Here, we're specifically thinking about modeling the dynamics of the variable. We're asking about if we were to model this variable, how much information storage would we include in that model from the past of the variable by accounting for its past influence as a first step, okay? That is specifically what we're asking here. The reason for that is because when we look at time series dynamics in complex systems or the different variables within the system, naturally we look to the past of those variables first as a first step in explaining their dynamics. So here in our modeling of information processing, that is what we're doing as well. And we're doing that specifically to align with, to align our quantitative models of the complex systems information processing with the qualitative way that people talk about them. Our first activity, and I'll leave you to do this outside of the video, is to look at these example time series and for each one to try to predict the next value of the variable beyond what is shown. So here that's the last value for sample A. So we want to predict what happens at the next next time index. Here, that's the last one, what happens next, and so on, to try and predict the next value of the variable beyond what is shown. And when you do, to think very explicitly about what assumptions you made about the patterns that you were seeing, and where specifically you took the information from to understand those patterns and to make the prediction. And how much information did you get from the past there? How certain might you be of what's coming next? Okay. Now, there's no single right answer to what the next values are going to be, but I want you to think about what you might predict it to be and where you are taking that information from in that activity. So let's come now straight to our primary measure for information storage, and this is the active information storage, which asks how much information about the next observation of our time series process can be found in its past state, or how much would we model as ha having been having come from its past state? We can draw this diagrammatically and look then at the past state, that block vector uh, of past the past state of the variable and the next value here. And the active information storage is simply a mutual information between that past block and the next value. Okay, it's a very simple measure. Now, clearly, it's dependent on how far back in the past we look. So in the second line, we're writing it down as a function of the block length into the past that we're examining. In theory, we would like to take an infinite block there to look at all of the information in the past that could possibly be pertinent in our model for the next value. Empirically, we can't obviously use an infinite past length. So empirically, we're going to have something that's defined in terms of that past length there. We'll talk later on about how to determine what that length should be. We can write this down in terms of other measures that we already know. The information from the past about the next value is simply a difference between the single 
single value entropy, the single sample entropy here, and the entropy rate. And that makes sense, right? Because the entropy rate, as we saw from our previous session, was telling us how much information is left, how much uncertainty is left, sorry, in the variable once we have accounted for the past. So if we look at how much uncertainty we had in total, then how much is left after we've accounted from, for the past, obviously that difference is how much information we gained by looking at the past. We can also write it down in terms of uh, the log ratio of probabilities here as we can for any mutual information term. We can write it down as a posterior probability of the next value given the past state versus the prior probability of the next value looked at on its own. Then we can also recognize that we could make a local or a pointwise active information storage. The information from a specific past state at time n or n plus one here, the information at that specific, uh, at that, that, that that's used in predicting the specific next value n from the specific past state uh, from time n backwards. Okay, so what that gives us, what that gives us then is a time series. What that gives us then is a time series of how the information storage is being used in the dynamics of the variable at every point in time. So we can see using these local or pointwise values how the information storage in use is fluctuating through time. And that may well be related to the dynamics of the system and tell us something very interesting about what's taking place there. We'll look at examples of that later on. So there are a number of interpretations that we can make of the active information storage here. Importantly, as an information theoretic measure, it's capturing a total amount of memory, including both not linear and nonlinear effects. Okay. The autocorrelation that you may be familiar with is just the linear component of the predictive contribution of each of these past values considered separately. So autocorrelation will tell us the relationship of this previous value to that one, the previous value two back to that one and so on, but it's looking at them all, not only independently of each other, but also looking at the linear components only. The active information storage looks at the contribution of all of them as a collective and takes the nonlinear component into account as well. We can then think about what types of information storage are being captured, captured by the active information storage here. Firstly, we must understand it's capturing the storage in the dynamics, as opposed to what may be passive changes in the underlying structure. Now here, I'm thinking specifically about neural dynamics. We know that the brain stores information physically by changing uh, the nature of the wiring between neurons, okay? The active information storage is picking up predictive effects in the dynamics. Now those dynamics should reflect underlying passive changes in structure, but they're not directly measuring the underlying structure, a uh, change in the structure itself. There are several aspects that those active uh, that the active storage in dynamics may be reflecting. It could be reflecting internally or causally stored information within the variable itself. There may be mechanisms within what our variable is representing, storing the information inside that element in the system. It will also pick up what we call distributed information storage. So storage that is not mechanistically within the variable, but may be leaving that variable and coming back into it later via feedback and feed forward loops that is recurrent connections or network effects. The information could leave X, leave X, go to other variables and come back into X later via other connections in some kind of feedback or feed forward loop. The AS will capture both that and internally mechanistically stored information. It will also pick up what we call input driven storage. So patterns in the input dynamics that drive a variable, if they are reflected in the variables activity that will be picked up as well. All of these mechanisms are intrinsically modeled as information storage to an observer when we're accounting for the information processing taking place here. A classic example of that are the two processes I'm showing here. The time series dynamics of both are the same, but the mechanisms are different. 
Here, what we're showing in this first process one is variables X and Y, which simply swap their values at each point in time versus a different mechanism where each of X and Y are inverting their values at each time step. Now, if they're initialized in the right way, they will show exactly the same pattern of dynamics. And without knowing that structure, we won't be able, uh, without knowing that structure, we won't be able to say which it is. But when we're modeling the information processing taking place there, it doesn't really matter. We're simply modeling, we're modeling the contribution of the past first, and then looking at uh, the contribution of the sources after that. So the active information storage will pick up information storage in both ways for the variables here in the, from this perspective of modeling the dynamics. In our next short video, we'll look at how to use the JDT toolkit to estimate this measure of active information storage.